evening, everybody, and welcome to the Queen Anne's County Board of Education meeting for October 4th, 2023. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, the board met in closed session. Is someone going to yes. review that? Pursuant to the general provisions, Article 3-305 and 3-104, the Board of Education of Queen Anne's County met in a closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom this public body has jurisdiction, any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. And I'm sorry, there's another one too. Consult with... Council to obtain legal advice. All right, thank you. Approval of the uh, agenda. Has everybody had a time to review the mm -hmm. agenda for tonight? Do I have a motion? Move to approve the agendas presented. Second. Motion and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Approval of the minutes for September 20th, 2023 open session. Move to accept the, the minutes as presented. Second. Second. Motion and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Dr. Salins. Yes, we have extra Ooh. awards tonight. Yes, we do. Yes. Ready? Good evening. As I said, we have some extra awards this evening that we're excited about. Am I good? Okay, so Queen Anne's County High School College Board National Rural and Small Town Award recognition. Five Queen Anne's County High School students have been awarded the College Board's National Rural and Small Town Award. This is an award through College Board's National Recognition Program, which awards academic honors to sophomores and juniors who have taken eligible administrations of the AP Advanced Placement Test, the PSAT or PSAT 10 exams, and have a GPA of 3.5 or higher, and identify that they attend high school in a small or rural town. This is quite an accomplishment. A very well-deserved congratulations to these following students, five students, which I think we have um, not everyone here tonight, but so I'd like to invite up Elizabeth Hamilton. Also, Quinlan Justice. And Megan Shorts. And those that are not in attendance today are Molly Holthost and Elizabeth Oldfield. Dr. Bryce is here on behalf of the students from the administration, so thank you for being here. Um, congratulations again. So our next award is one that we normally don't do this evening as well for Ken Island High School AP Honor Roll Recognition. So we will have, um, the administrators can come on up. We have President, um, Principal, I almost called you President. We have Principal <laughs> Dan Harding <laughs> and Dr. Rankin, the Academic Dean. Ken Island High School has earned a place on the College Board's AP School Honor Roll for the 2022-23 school year. The AP School Honor Roll recognizes schools that have done outstanding work to welcome more students into AP courses and support them on their path to college success. 
Ken Island High School earned an overall bronze rating for the 2022-23 school year, but is aiming for silver or gold this year. This rating is based on the percentage of students in the graduating class who have taken an AP exam at any point in high school, the percentage of students in the graduating class who have scored a three or higher on at least one exam, the and the percentage of the students in the graduating class who took five or more AP exams in high school where at least one exam was taken in ninth or 10th grade. Cat Island High School had 81.25% of their students score a three or higher on an AP exam last year and is currently offering 23 advanced placement courses to their students. A very big congratulations to the hardworking students of Cat Island High School and the support of their administrative staff. So congratulations. over a little bit to the right for me, please. Your other right, sorry. <laughs> thank you. Perfect, thank you very much. Very good. All right. And now for our traditional awards. We're starting off with the Energy Bunny Award. This award is given to staff members who volunteer or keep on going. It is sponsored by Bayview Financial. And if Mr. Chip Brittingham and Mr. Wayne Humphreys will please come forward with their Energizer Bunny. And I'd actually like Dr. Sprinkle to come up because this was, oh, she's already here. <laughs> so this October's Energizer Bunny is Mrs. Gina Morris. The Energizer Bunny Award for the month of October is presented to Mrs. Gina Morris, who is an interpreter and a parent liaison for Queen Anne's County Public Schools. Mrs. Morris works extremely hard to ensure our English language learners and their families have the needed support and connection to school. She is well known and respected by the Hispanic and Latino populations within Queen Anne's County. This is due to her unrelenting efforts to call and visit families within our community. Families are responsive to Mrs. Morris because she is highly visible. In addition, she is well respected by her colleagues and is often consulted for her expertise. Congratulations. Our next award is the Spirit Award. This award is given to an individual who embodies the spirit of Queen Anne's County Public Schools. Again, nominated by Dr. Marcia Sprankle, and our October Spirit Award winner is Dr. Stacy Rankin. And her, we know that, that Principal Harding is here if he wants to come on up. Oh, look at that. <laughs> the Spirit Award for the month of October is presented to, as I said, Dr. Stacy Rankin, who is the academic dean at, at Ken Island High School. Dr. Rankin is known for her strong advocacy for students. She does everything possible to ensure students are successful and knows how to tap into district and community resources to support students' academic needs. This also includes thinking outside of the box. Dr. Rankin is always willing to support the district's need when she is called upon. She has been instrumental in helping the, to develop key foundational documents for the high schools in our district. Dr. Rankin is extremely knowledgeable and is a true asset to Queen Anne's County Public Schools. Congratulations. <laughs>
And our last award for this evening is the Shining Star Award. This award is presented to an individual in our school system who shines. And also nominated by Dr. Marcia Sprinkle, our October Shining Star is Betsy Andrews. The Shining Star Award for the month of October is presented to Mrs. Elizabeth, also known as Betsy Andrews, Administrative Assistant to the Assistant Superintendent and English Language Arts Supervisor. In addition, she is the coordinator for our Teacher of the Year program, which is huge. <laughs> um, Betsy's ability and willingness to perform her many job responsibilities to assist whenever it is needed serves as an example of her work ethic and dedication to Queen Anne's County Public Schools. Have you worked in an environment and things that just need to happen just start happening, that's Betsy's working behind the scenes. She is a strong and mighty force in Queen Anne's County Public Schools. Betsy's tremendous strength, work ethic, loyalty, and desire to perform well each day is greatly appreciated and has been nothing but inspirational. Congratulations. Everybody's departing, most everybody. Board involvement. Uh, would any member like the floor? Sure. Um, let's see. What month is this? October, September 19th. Churchill Elementary back to school night was awesome. It was also the day that we got the announcement about them being a blue ribbon school. Um, and so that was very nice to be there to watch some of the kids go back and well, meet their teachers and get some information. Um, but on a more sh shorter note, I attended the MABE conference the last couple of days. There were some awesome um, speakers and activities, but the one that made it perfect for me, um, there was a lady that gave us a briefing on security around schools. Um, things to do, things to look for, how the community, students, teachers, and parents can help reduce the amount of violence that we have in our schools. And they talked about a lot of the training and things that go on, and I want to say that everything she talked about, Joe is already doing for us, nice. Joe Sabori. Yeah. And I was just grinning from ear to ear going, yeah, we already had that, or we already <laughs> did that training, because he's already set that up for us. And um, when I talked to her afterwards, she actually knew him, and so... I was just very thankful that we have him in our district helping us making our schools safe. So. Excellent. I would second that for Joseph Murray. I just want to say, speaking of the Blue Ribbon Schools, it was so nice to go down Route 8 every day and see an LED lights for Manatee <laughs> yes. Elementary School on the American Legion uh, board. Yeah. Yes. Um, but then also we attended the first meeting of our Citizen Advisory Committee, and I just want to get a shout out to that group who are behind the scenes um, helping the board and helping the citizens make some connection and, and you know, that telling us about what the community wants. And so that was a great meeting and look forward to the rest of them. Anybody else? All right. Let's see, student board members. Uh, Ms. Forti is at a track meet tonight and I believe Dr. Kibler is going to uh, deliver the <laughs> report. On the CAC? No. No, 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 the student uh, board oh, members. I'm sorry. I, That's all right. I was waiting for, yeah, sure. I have, um, <laughs> Sorry about that. The Queen Anne's County High School rep from Nay tonight because she couldn't be in attendance. So um, just it's a series of dates, due dates for the um, for the month of October. So just to begin, uh, October fifth tomorrow is the last day to register for the November SAT. Um, October seventh is SAT testing. Uh, October eleventh, the flu mist vaccines will be given to students who signed up. The 12th senior class meeting with Jocelyn's, plus they will have a table set up during lunches so seniors can order their cap and gowns. 
The 16th and 17th is the last chance for um, prestige portraits to take the senior uh, portraits and exclamation point, that's the last call for that. <laughs> the 18th, PSAT testing for sophomore and junior students who signed up. Um, this day is also underclassmen makeup picture day. The 19th, senior sibling photos are due to the yearbook staff. The 20th is a professional development day, um, no school for students. The 25th, the ASVAB fall testing for sophomores. October 26th is the Nas National Honor Society inductions at 6 p.m. And finally, the uh, FFA students will be traveling to Indianapolis from October 31st to the 4th of November for the FFA National Convention. All right, thank, thank you for you. that report. Cody, Sandifer. Thank you. What you got? Uh, uh, good evening. Uh, Ken Allen has, got, has had a lot going on as we are now, now halfway through our first quarter. Last week, we had a clubs and activities fair during lunch, which allowed clubs to kind of advertise themselves and student, students could walk around and find after school activities that interested them. We have also been focusing on mental health and suicide prevention. Our KIHS Students for Wellness Club participated in our suicide prevention and awareness walk this past weekend. And today we had an assembly that was given by Alex Boyer, which was also for suicide prevention. Uh, this week for our school is college application week and our guidance office has planned a bunch of activities to help people interested in four-year schools uh, find colleges and start applying to them. Uh, one of these is a college bingo, which gets students to ask teachers about their uh, college experiences and like find what might be right for them. Uh, this month, Ken Island is offering both the PSAT and ASVAB exams to any interested students. And next week is our homecoming and spirit week, which will include a pep rally on Friday. Every day, Next week, there is a theme to dress up, and on Saturday, we have a parade at 11 p.m., a game at 1 p.m., and our dance will be at 6 p.m. We are also very excited to announce that Ms. Schulte, QACPS's Teacher of the Year and MD School or High School Art Teacher of the Year, will be honored as Maryland Teacher of the Year finalist on October 13th. Thank Outstanding. You. Oh, Outstanding. Thank you. Thank you. You know, the, the ASVAB test, is, that, is it the military? Yes. Yes, so they offer it at the schools? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. In both schools. Excellent. Dr. Sands. Yeah, so I'm just going to give a big shout out for Queen Anne's County Goes Purple. We had our purple games. We had our ambassadors out. We did t-shirts for the games and everything. The games were both just wonderful and successful and a good time, but for a good reason, too, mm -hmm. to support it. So I just want to give a shout out for that. The, the schools did an excellent job with recognizing that and promoting it and and I was happy to be a part of it. Okay. Oh, and they, they both won, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> That's important. Very good. Yeah. Okay, moving on to citizen participation, public comment. Do we have anyone signed up? I have no one signed up today. All right. Is that a first? That might be a first. Uh, I don't know. In a long time. It is, yes. Okay, then we'll move on to information items. Uh, first is the uh, state of the data review. Dr. Kibler. Good evening, President Schifanelli, Dr. Salins, board members and executive team. I'm Dr. Matt Kibler, the Director of Accountability. So I'm here tonight to present to you um, a st state of the data review. This is really a, a review of our 2022-2023 uh, MCAP data results. Uh, Mr. John Groh, our new Supervisor of Accountability Assessment and Data Management, um, he would normally be making this presentation, un had an unfortunate incident in the family, couldn't be here. So I'm gonna step in tonight, do the best I can, obviously in my department, um, but any questions we have, and I know I'll get to it, but we have some other opportunities for him to come back to continue talking about data as well. This is just one piece we wanted to share tonight. Uh, so just to begin, our purpose is to review last school year's MCAP data. Um, this is basically the Maryland State testing. A look at our trends. This is our, um, so we have English, math, science, and government that we'll be looking at tonight. We also um, put some data in here to look at iReady results. So this is the math and English 
um, assessments, local assessments that students are performing in their classes. We wanted you to see some comparisons there and as well as a little bit of an update on what's coming and what has happened on the Maryland report card. So I will say part of um, this is timely, the Maryland report card that we've shared and talked about with you before. This MCAP data that I'm presenting tonight, that was just updated on the report card last week. And I'll get to it again at the end, just as a reminder, uh, with the Maryland report card, there's more data than just testing results. The full thing will be updated, including updating our school star ratings in December. But we wanted to make sure now that the MCAP data results were released in public last week that we were also presenting that to you all here tonight. So we'll start um, just with that. Uh, so to begin, we have our ELA results, our English language arts results. And as you can see, our grades three to eight assessments. So statewide, 47% of students are proficient in ELA for grade three to eight. Queen Anne's County, you'll see we are down um, just about the darkest blue we can get there. 59% of our students tested proficient as compared to 47% for the state of Maryland. So we are um, the top five there in the state. And if you remember these graphs, from last year, this is this is similar. The darker the blue on this state map, the higher the proficiency level, or the, the larger total number of students that are proficient. So you can see we're second in the shore there looking at that graph. This will be our first opportunity here. I wanted to talk about, um, you know, the, the MCAP, is one test, one snapshot in time at the end, end of the year in general, grades three to eight. What we wanted to show was just how much growth our students really see throughout the year. And what you look at on this, this is grades three to eight iReady results. Um, the pre-test at the beginning of the year is the top bar. The post-test at the end of the year is on the bottom. And what you can see is we had 32% of students that would have been tested proficient, sort of that equivalent to the MCAP results at the beginning of the year. And that basically doubles by the end of the year. So when we talk about student proficiency, yes, we can get one metric, how, how many of our students are proficient, but we think it's important that we're also looking at just frankly, how much growth students are having throughout the year. Even though a student might not test proficient on that one MCAP test, we feel it's important to just to show how much all of our students are growing throughout the entire year. The English 10 assessment. So statewide, 54% of students tested proficient. In Queen Anne's County, that percentage is 67%. And when you say English 10, that's 10th grade, right? That's the 10th grade, right. yes, at the end of so the, clear. yeah. So this would have been from either the combined result of the students that took it the, um, from the fall semester or spring semester, yes, and it's in English 10. So Queen Anne's County, 67% proficient compared to 54% statewide, and again, second on the shore, top five in the state. And then, um, for ELA in general, we wanted to show just the proficiency. Proficiency. <laughs> you get it for me. Try it again. Uh, I'm not going to try it again. <laughs> oh, well, sometimes the it's trend a and <laughs> um, over the last five years, uh, not more than five years, the last five administrations of the test, there was a um, three-year or a two-year gap because of COVID. And we've also changed tests in there. We had the old park tests in 2017, 18, 19. But if we want to look at trends, unfortunately, we do kind of still have to go back and look at that. And what you'll notice is that not only are we above Maryland in all three levels, above the average, which was already shown in those graphs, but really in ELA, we've talked a lot about learning loss during COVID. And we are back to those pre-COVID levels if, in proficiency for ELA. And just a couple key findings for English language arts remain in the top five, uh, second in the Eastern Shore, and all schools remain above the state levels. It's about 11% above the level in elementary, 
almost 14% in middle and almost 14% in high school. And then we'll move into math if that's okay. So I think nationally and statewide, there's been a lot of uh, a lot in the news about math scores across the country and the state. And it, we're not unique here in Queen Anne's County that uh, our proficiency levels are not as high as our ELA proficiency levels. 32% um, profession here in Queen Anne's County as compared to 25% to the state in grades three to eight. And I'll show the iReady as well. And this is, I think, really important to look at this growth throughout the year. Again, are our proficiency levels where we would want? No, but if you can look at the growth from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, where we had only 19% that looked on grade level at the beginning of the year, that increased three times in the, um, in the course of the year, which I think is important. We know with COVID there was learning loss there. Um, our students are coming back, they're growing. They're not meeting the math proficiency levels yet. They are a new test. Um, I know that Mr. Grow, the supervisor of accountability is working with Ms. Smith, the supervisor of mathematics. Um, looking at our data, they're planning to come back and do a presentation to you, I believe in November with some work that they're doing to address math scores and proficiency in the county, as well as sharing with you some of the initiatives that the state has around mathematics um, to address where we're at. The Algebra One assessment, Queen Anne's County, we had tested at 18% versus 17% statewide. So you can see we are more middle of the pack in the state of Maryland on Algebra One. In general, this is uh, students, there's no set necessarily grade level like the English 10 test when the students are taking Algebra 1. This could be um, in eighth grade in middle school, freshman year um, of high school. It's the combined results there. And then you can see our proficient, pro, man, I did it when I said it again. Now I can't say it. <laughs> um, but anyway, you can see our trends here. We have not got back to pre. COVID levels for mathematics. And again, I think um, with the combined efforts of Mr. Grow and Ms. Smith looking at our data and, and continuing to dive in in recommendations from the state and other initiatives here internally, I look, personally, I look forward and I hope you do too to um, a continued conversation around mathematics and their presentation. Again, I believe in November with some ideas to address this. And just those key findings. So we did maintain the 32% proficiency level in grades three to eight, eighth in the state, 18% um, in algebra one, again, middle of the pack, still second on the Eastern shore, like our ELA scores and performing just a little bit better than the state average uh, middle school particularly stood out. So hopefully the hope would be with the middle, um, middle school out, Algebra one scores continue to grow. We'll just continue to see us um, increasing the math proficiency. We also have the science results. This is the MISA test. So the state proficiency level here is 34 and a half percent for last school year. Queen Anne's County um, third, uh, fourth in the state, excuse me, 44% proficiency. Very proud about that. And that's number one on the shore. That's the grade five, the grade eight science. Third in the state, 37.6% compared to 26 um, in the state. And just, a, just at the top on the shore. And this is, um, this is just showing the score itself. So we, um, 41% proficient. Um, the average scale score was a 742 in the state versus 744 here in Queen Anne's County. So this is the high school um, science test. And you can see that increase um, 
got the scale a little off there. I missed that when we put this in here. So it's we, we did not double in proficiency, but uh, did see an increase from last year over the past two years. Key findings were in the top four in the state. The uh, biology scores are going up. The high school scores 7% higher and um, doing well in science. And then lastly, our government results. Again, our scale score, our high school government, um, the students tested 47% proficient and their score was an average of 442 versus the state average of 436. And I'm assuming the state did not put the same graphs together that they did for ELA and math. There's such a focus there, and that's why we had to present the data in this, in this way. So our average high school government scores are 5% higher than the statewide average, and we're ninth in the state, second on the shore again. So just as sort of a last update here, the data that we just saw here is updated on the Maryland report card. I believe um, it was updated around September 27th, I think was the go live for that. Um, excuse me if I'm a day or two off on that, but that was just recent. That's why we wanted to bring that to you here today. Um, at this link, you all in the public can go and see our data. You can look at it by the district, the county, down to the school level, the grade level, and by different demographics and the different student groups. Um, MSDE will update the full report card in December. So again, when we talk about full report card, that's gonna have things like uh, high school graduation rate, attendance rate, um, and then the star ratings will update in December as well. So after that, we plan another, depending on what the actual release date of that, would we do a, the board work session in December or the January board update, but we'll come back and share that with you all again. And I'm happy to take any questions right now. Well, the math scores that we've got, uh, as low as they are nationwide and within the state and even the county, is are these still attributed to the COVID learning loss or are there other theories out there why math generally is so, so, I, so low? I would speak to a couple, a couple points. First off, if you go back to the trends, you can see a significant drop in that COVID year mm -hmm. from when we came out of COVID. We know that's part of it. The other thing that happened on this graph, just like ELA, we went from the PARC test to the MCAP tests. And when they went to MCAP tests, they were also um, working on the cut scores. <laughs> So what counts as proficient, what doesn't for each of the levels. And there's a lot of discussion at the state level of what's appropriate or not. And with the MCAP test, they actually increase the cut score. And I, we can bring that data and it's actually a part of the November presentation we'll see. I believe it was somewhere 10 to 20% of our students are what they would call like on the cusp. So just below that cut score. So if the cut scores were where they were like mirroring um, old assessments, they actually would be testing proficient. So it's not all just us here doing one test. The state's still trying to get the math test right, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, now, the levels are still lower than ELA. We know there's a problem, but we know the test is playing a part in that too. I just wanted to share, actually, um, we were in a MABE conference yesterday, a presentation um, with the state and they share that they have been doing a year long research project, basically looking at our testing to see, is it actually aligned to what the expectations are um, to show that they're gonna be successful when they leave here, meaning to higher ed expectations. Um, and over and above that, looking specifically at those cusp students and also bringing in other indicators such as GPA. Here on the shore um, in our MOU with Chesapeake College, several years ago, um, we did petition and determine that a certain specific grade point average does predict that a student will be successful, um, actually at a higher rate than their actual um, score when it, in and of itself of a snapshot in time. So that, you know, um, looking at your, your GPA is over a long period of time. And so I know that they're gonna be coming out, um, the state board will be having a state meeting where they're going to be sharing this information. I believe it's next week. Um, and I, I say to, to tune in because I'll be tuning in for sure um, because they will be voting on and making a decision on um, basically changing the cut score and or a combination of adding GPA 
um, which will positively impact. So what they did is they trended and followed students who left school and attended college and to see what was their GPA and were they successful. And what was that range? Was it um, 2.75 and they were successful? Was it a 3.0 and they were successful? And also the students who had earned um, a score that was below the cut but considered on the cusp within two or three points, mm -hmm. um, were they successful? And what the, the research is showing that they were successful. So that's telling us that as a, as a state, we've, we've put that cut mark too high. And so that will impact our students. And if they're being successful at you know, getting a score lower and they're still being successful, then we need to give them credit for that. So those cusp students should be getting credit. And it will impact us overall because as it relates to the blueprint for Maryland schools, um, CCR indicators in there help students to access, um, you know, uh, additional dual enrollment opportunities uh -huh. or CTE opportunities. So we want to make sure that as a state of Maryland that we get it right so that we can have, you know, those students, more students accessing um, what they need to, to make them successful um, as they move from school to either college or, or a, you know, some type of apprenticeship or uh, business work. So um, more to come and we really do need to tune in and next time um, we will have a math update on what we're doing. Um, I do think there's a multitude of variations. Um, I also think we've talked about the training and professional development for our staff um, as it relates to math, conceptually speaking. Uh, math is something that you build on different skill sets. Right. Um, you can't do kind of one thing without knowing how to do one thing. Sure. And reading approach, the science of reading is different than that. So I do think that that plays a role here of what as school districts throughout the state of Maryland that we do need to do to provide our staff with more um, opportunities for professional development, which we're always fighting because we only have so many professional development days. Mm -hmm. They get filled very quickly. We've been doing an initiative for the science of reading. So we put a lot of time and energy in that. And, and if, when we're doing that, what else falls off? Right. And so, you know, um, so those are all things that we need to work on for sure. But next next month we'll come back with um, what we are doing um, and, and we'll have a hopefully a state um, determination on what what the changes to the CCR um, are going to be. So stay tuned. A lot of our rankings look very good. I mean, we're in the top three or four. I guess the one that, I, that stands out to me is the algebra mm -hmm. one. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we're in the middle of the pack there. Mm -hmm. uh, we seem to do very well with everything else. You know, and if, you're, if we're all being judged the same, you know, okay, the test might not be right, this might not be right, we have to change things, but we're still in the, the algebra one looks like to me, we need resources to be put there. That's looks like where we're lagging compared Absolutely. to most other things. Yep. And it, it will be interesting. It's gonna it's gonna take time. I understand. But, yeah, but, yeah, but when we look at this graph, the elementary students Stand. where their proficiency level Stand. is, <clears throat> let's get it's gonna take five years. Right. Get them up to algebra. Mm -hmm. Um and, and see see where we're at coming out of continuing to come out of the pandemic. But you're but you're right, Mr. Smith. So, and the immediate we need to figure out. I mean, and, you know, and I know it's not an overnight fix. It's no, a, but, I mean, it's, yeah, it's but a building block thing, like Dr. Salen says. But somehow, we're 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 not doing as good a job in that avenue as we are some of the other ones. Mm -hmm. Agreed. All right. Any further questions? No. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Matt. We really appreciate that yeah. standing in. Of course. Mm -hmm. Okay. Capital improvement program update, Mr. Barclay. Good evening, President Schifanelli, Vice President Bennett, board members, Superintendent Salins, executive teams. I'm Dara Baraclo, School Facility Coordinator. I'm here this evening to present an overview for Queen Anne's County Public Schools Capital Improvement Program for fiscal years 2025 through 2030. The CIP serves many purposes, first and foremost, uh, a board approved CIP must be provided to the IAC each year. Additionally, it helps align the state and county funding programs with the needs of the school system. 
there are essentially two types of projects, major capital projects in which the state participates and minor capital projects in which the state does not participate in. Uh, for examples, uh, the major projects are new and replacement schools, renovations, additions, systemic renovations such as uh, roof replacement, uh, HVAC replacement, and then moving into the minor projects that would be interior adjustments like um, guided vestibule improvements, interior painting, uh, playground improvements, technology updates. Uh, site work, paving projects, those sorts of things which are ineligible for state funding. The costs typically for major projects uh, that the state participates in are $200,000 or greater and uh, regarding uh, the, uh, they're technically minor capital projects when it comes down to local, but they can vary greatly. You'll see that when we get into the, a uh, little bit further in the presentation on some of the local projects that are in excess of nine, $9 million for this fiscal year. So um, cost share formula. One of the things that you may notice with, uh, with this year's CIP, in July of 2023, the IAC adopted new state share figures for fiscal year 25 and 26. The revised share uh, for Queen Anne's County went downward from 51% participation to 50% participation. The IAC reviews several factors which are listed to the left of the, the slide there. Um, within this year's CIP, uh, moving on, you may notice a few changes from prior year's CIP that um, I've, from my prior experience with uh, where I came from school system wide, we incorporated some uh, additional things with the CIP to kind of help uh, provide information on the, the various projects and kind of give a little bit of a narrative on things. One of the, one of the few pages that you'll see, we've uh, each fiscal year, um, we provide a uh, narrative uh, for each of the uh, state participated projects as well as the locally funded projects. Uh, within that narrative, you'll see uh, the state share, the local share, and then obviously on the local share projects or the locally funded projects, there's zero dollars from state standpoint and it's 100% funded locally. Uh, piggybacking on to the narrative side of things, uh, another new addition to the CIP is basically a strict accounting dollar-wise for each project uh, for each fiscal year, uh, both from uh, projects that receive IAC funding and projects that are locally funded. Here you'll see a breakdown of what the state participation is, what the local participation is, and then the total project cost. And then each project is listed in its uh, priority. So for example, in fiscal year 25, if the state doesn't give us all $7 million that we're, we're looking for, we would prioritize the funding based on projects from one to four for, for fiscal year 25. Uh, one of the things that happens kind of behind the scenes of the uh, capital project or capital improvement program is in order to develop the project costs from a grand scale, I've got to go in and, and develop um, things like the soft costs for uh, furniture and equipment and, and uh, as well as design costs and then break it down with the 50-50 split that we're now doing with the state share. And then um, on a project such as um, Center, um, Centerville Middle School, since that's a multi-year funded project, then I have to work out the cash flow. That's something that also kind of takes place kind of behind the scenes of the CIP. So moving on to the fiscal year 2025 funded projects, First project on the agenda for, for funding is Centerville Middle School Planning. This is going to basically fund the architectural engineering costs. Uh, we did just receive uh, a uh, cost proposal from Wheeler Goodman Massick, who are the architects who are doing um, the central office building to participate in ed specs for uh, for the new Centerville school. Uh, so the process there will be, we'll develop ed specs, then that will determine the program for the school. We'll move into a feasibility study that will then tell us what 
direction we're going to go, whether that's going to be a replacement school or will that be a, uh, a renovation of the existing school. So that feasibility will basically that all of that and then we'll move right from uh, the, the feasibility into the, the design and that's what this $3.7 million is for. Um, moving on, we have a couple of systemic projects. We have Queen Anne's County High School roof replacement. That's an $8.7 million project. Third on the list is Queen Anne's County High School fire alarm replacement. Um, we do have uh, quite a few fire alarm replacement projects in forecasted years uh, of, of, the, uh, of the fiscal year CIP moving out in, in, in other years. Um, the reason for that is, is they've all pretty much, the older systems have reached end of life. We're having issues. A lot of the smoke detectors can't be replaced. Um, programming the system, it's just, it's just kind of fallen to its end of life. So the, we've got them in uh, on an annual basis, pretty much we're doing at least one fire alarm replacement each, each year. Uh, and then last on the list is, oh, we're doing two this year, um, next year, Canards. Uh, Canard Elementary School fire alarm project. This uh, this actually is a carryover from uh, prior year uh, CIP. The county has actually already funded this project, but the state we moved state funding uh, that the state was willing to give us. We moved the state funds to help fund the Kent Island High School roof replacement that we did last. Uh, last fiscal year, so we're kind of moving this one again forward, so that hopefully we can hopefully we can get this one funded and, and completed next year. Um, moving into FY25 locally funded projects, uh, first on the list is the uh, this would actually be the second year of funding for the new central office building. Um, FY24, the county already has given us about $9.3 million for the first year of construction, which pretty much falls in line with where we are design-wise and bid-wise. That project will be going out for bid uh, roughly in about a month. It's, it's scheduled to hit the streets November 1st with bids expected before year end. And then hopefully come the new year, we should be bringing a, a contractor and a bid forward that, that we can uh, ask for approval for. So this, uh, this $9 million here, which would become available in July of next year, will be the second year and final year of funding for the, the building construction. Um, obviously, with a new building comes new furnishings and equipment. The county is, is uh, funding $1.5 million for that. Um, we have Kent Island High School storm sewer repairs as the next project on the list. Um, if you're familiar with what we did this past summer at Kent Island, we had a lot of uh, underground stormwater repairs. They did work at the uh, stormwater management facilities there to dress them up and clean them up. Um, there was quite a bit of areas that were um, a little worse off than what was expected. So this is kind of a phase two of repairs there. And this is actually, an, the, the estimate here is taken right from the contractor who was doing the phase one work. So we feel pretty confident that this is a good number of what we're gonna see in phase two for Ken Island High School. Uh, the fourth on the list is Kennard Elementary School storm sewer repairs. Um, this is a, a fairly small uh, project, but um, uh, we had a sinkhole um, appear in the field of Kennard over this past summer. And after further investigation, there's just a, a, there's some things that are going on underground there that we want to get an, uh, an engineer involved in it. More than likely, we're going to have to do some sort of stormwater management to address the uh, the parking lot that's closest um, closest to the road, it's not the front parking; it's kind of the side the side parking. Uh, we're going to have to do some uh, uh, repairs to the storm sewer that's underground there. And then now that we're uh, since this would become a new project, we're going to be forced to adhere to new uh, best management practices with stormwater mitigation and um, stormwater runoff and filtering and pretreatment and those sorts of things that um, that weren't in, uh, employed at the in the original design for that. Um, 
Fifth on the list is Queen Anne High School Stadium field lighting replacement. That would be a replacement of the, the stadium lights. We would be moving to LED lights for that facility. And then next on the list is elementary school interactive display and middle school, high school interactive laser projector replacements. And what we're doing there is we are plugging in replacements for the different schools on an annual basis so that we're kind of staying ahead of the end of life for those devices and trying to stay uh, on the edge of technology improvements for the schools. As the technology improves, we're, we're trying to stay stay in in time with that uh, seventh on the list is a playground replacement at Sudlersville elementary school for the ages two through five playground replacement last on the list is universal pre-k furniture which is a two hundred thousand dollar funding from local um, overall for uh, the state funded projects uh, from fiscal year 26 through uh, 2030 I'll go through these pretty quickly. We have Mattapeak partial roof replacement, Kennard Elementary School HVAC, Kennard Elementary School full roof replacement, and then last for 2026 would be the Kent Island Elementary School fire alarm replacement. Moving on to 2027, we've got Mattapeak Middle School partial roof replacement. One of the um, points I'd like to make with this is, is you'll see that that is starting at priority two. The reason why that's starting at priority two is, is that priority one for 2027 would be the construction funding for Centerville Middle School, whatever we're going to do there, whether that's a replacement school or a renovation. So that would be priority one for that, for that fiscal year. 2027, Centerville Elementary School fire alarm replacement. Moving into 2028, we have Queen Anne's High School Addition Study. And number three for that fiscal year is Kent Island High School Addition Study. Again, those two projects start at number two because that marks the second year of funding for Centerville Middle School. Um, one of the other points that I wanted to make, um, the high school addition study, the feasibility study, as well as the, the construction, um, those are carryovers from, from the prior year's fiscal budget, uh, fiscal year uh, cycle that was presented and approved last year. Uh, with the board's comments at the last meeting and a lot of discussion that's been happening in the last month or two about this project and potentially can, uh, making this a CTE, obviously making this a CTE could potentially provide some relief to the high schools. So there's a lot of things that are going to be kind of in motion with, with uh, the, the, the fiscal year budgets that are out in that 28, 29 range once we figure out what we're going to do with this building if the county buys into this becoming a you know a CTE full full fledged CTE building like i say we can we're going to it's going to relieve a lot of the square footage issues at the at the high school level which is obviously going to improve the enrollment and uh, capabilities at those two sites uh, 29 uh, we have the Queen Anne's High School addition construction Kent Island High School addition construction Mattapeak Middle School fire alarm replacement, Mattapeak Elementary School fire alarm replacement, and we're into fiscal year 30 with Centerville Elementary School HVAC. And wrapping up, am I wrapping up? No, I've got one more. Um, Graysonville Elementary School um, HVAC and Bayside Elementary School boiler and pump replacement. So you see we've got a lot of uh, systemics in the future years with roof replacement, fire alarm replacements, and uh, HVAC jobs. So that pretty much wraps up my CIP. So any questions? Pretty comprehensive. Yeah, yeah, I, <laughs> I, tried to, I tried to put as much information in here as I could because I know there's a lot of balls in the air right now with, with uh, projects and um, you know, the, the county is willing to fund uh, quite a bit of projects. I'm, I'm, where I came from, I didn't have that luxury. So I'm, I'm trying to take advantage of every dollar they want to spend. So right. I'm, I'm, Smart move. 
I did have a question just about our the state funded ones for fiscal year 25. It just seemed there was a big a bigger chunk of the state funds than local. Is, was there some reason why they're doing a higher percentage on that um, Centerville Middle School planning? Let me go Sorry, back. Yeah, it's a, the fiscal year 25 state funded projects. Yeah, that's, um, I don't have a really good explanation for why the breakdown is that way. Um, I'm grateful, don't get me it, wrong. It is, um, on state funded projects, when we start talking about planning, there's really no science to it. They, they pretty much give you the form and you enter in the enrollment, you, you enter in enrollment projections, current enrollment and those sorts of things. And then when you start talking about the square footage, you plug those numbers in and, it, and it's all derived from the number of students that pushes the square footage. And then the funding just works down in the spreadsheet. Um, one of the things that is gonna happen from here tonight is, is if, the, if the CIP is approved, it then moves to the state level for review. They'll take a look at this. There may be some shifts here and there with the money, but the only answer that I can give you that, that I can say for sure is is that's that, that that's the way the form broke it down. Okay. Um, when we do get into, um, it, it's not in the presentation because I didn't um, I didn't want to uh, make the slides too too drawn out. It was already it was already long enough. I didn't get into um, the uh, construction funding in the presentation, but it is in the actual uh, CIP. If you look at um, the state funding projections for FY 27 and 28, it does show the, the building breakdown and you'll see there that the local is actually uh, a few points higher than, than, the, um, than the state share there. And that's because the state doesn't participate in, in several items that, that, that they don't, they, they basically say are ineligible. Thank you. Just for clarification, um, just a few years ago, funding changed because they used to not sp give us any money for planning and they used to not give us any money for what we consider soft, you know, soft um, costs, which are usually associated more towards the end of the project as it relates to furnitures and things like that. And that's changed, correct? Right. And, right. I, and I feel like that may have some impact on these numbers, numbers that look higher. different. Yeah, the, not, I can't say that for sure, but. Yeah, the, the, the soft might, cost, the be. design cost, as well as the FFE, the, the furniture and equipment, they, they're now participating. Now participate, in, so. which they never did before. They just did bricks and mortar before. So that has changed. And I think that changes the calculation slightly. I mean, and this is a, I mean, to me, a very important document to this board because, you know, we do our yearly budgets for operating, but this capital budget gives us a future of what's going to happen because, you know, a lot of people saying, when's the middle school coming, what's happening, this and that, and it doesn't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. It's a, you know, it, it's a, it's a two or three year process before <laughs> yeah. you even your shovel ready. But also, this is what will, will be up for approval this evening. Yes, I also got to remember that next year, project, not days project, but a project two or three years down the road could get moved around somewhere because of different functions that go on because, you know, this might not be needed at the time and stuff like that. I think we, I think the Ken Allen High School roof was a perfect example. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and the other things that could come into that as well is if, uh, for example, if we start experiencing, um, you know, if we, if we knew that a roof needed to be replaced from an age standpoint, but if maintenance starts dealing with uh, very significant issues that begin to you know, impact the educational ability of that school. We're going to obviously move those sorts of things forward and then obviously maybe push an HVAC project out a little further to kind of make, make the, the funding work. Um, one of the things that goes into this is meeting with, with the county folks and making sure that we don't have a CIP that's like a roller coaster ride. They want, they want a pretty consistent CIP so that they're, that they're not, you know, trying to, trying to chase. Have twice as much money one year as the next year and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Right. Is that what happened a little bit with the Kenai Island sewer system? I mean, because you said that there were some issues that came up when they were working on that um, sewer repair. And so now there's a phase two as a result of, or was there always going to be a phase two? No, it, it is It is a result of what uh, what we found out, out in the field. And as a matter of fact, the, the, the phase one part of that was all addressed through uh, county DPW through, um, I, I believe it was an 
I, I, I don't want to know. I, I don't want to try to guess the acronym because I'll get it incorrect. But it was through a, a state grant, okay. um, so it was funded through a state grant, and they they came out and did a lot of the um, the storm sewer work. They did a lot of uh, corrections. They found a lot of things that just like anything else when you start digging in the ground you don't you don't know what you're going to find and, and we found a lot of problems that we didn't think we were going to encounter so um we uh, we had the contractor while he was working on uh on the project um I'll, I'll call it phase one it wasn't intended to be phase one but while he was working on the first phase um he cameraed a lot of lines and we found a lot of problems that were hidden underground that um, you know, just in the 20, 20, 25 years that that's, that that's, that those systems have been in operation, they've just gotten progressively work worse with time. Um, pipes that have become disconnected underground and misaligned just from, you know, activity of, of movement, soil settling and those sorts of things. Pipes have become misaligned, pipes have uh, become sagged and, and, and are holding water and, and, and different types of silt and those sorts of things. And um, we've even found some materials that, that shouldn't have been used, were used, and that sort of thing, so. Thanks. Well, I think it's a very good document for the general public, and especially parents, when they see our schools. Mm -hmm. They can look at this thing and say, yes, this is, you know, this is what we're looking at doing, and this is when we're looking at doing it. Because, um, so, you know, you always get these questions a lot of times. And, yeah, and that uh, was one of the things that, that I wanted to try to do with this CIP versus some of the, the prior CIPs is, is that if you just look at a state form and it's just got a lot of spreadsheet numbers all scattered around, it's kind of hard to, to put it all together. And that's why I wanted to create the narratives to kind of give just a quick snapshot of what each project is, whether it's it's in the um, just, just straight language of it's a roof replacement and the reason why we're doing a roof replacement, here's the financial breakdown from a state standpoint and a, and a local standpoint. I think, it, I think it provides a good snapshot of where we need to be in 25, but also for the next five years out. All right, any other questions? On mm -hmm. a follow-up question, the smart boards, yes. do you have a status? Are they completed now being installed or are we still they waiting on They are still a... being worked on. I think sure. we're down to, uh, like, I think, five left, if I'm not mistaken. Perfect. That Thank was a you. Canard. Yes. Perfect. Yes. And then we're moving on to two other schools for that also have some that need to be installed as well. Uh, yeah, I don't know the count on those right off the yeah. top of my head. It's not okay. a lot. But we do have two other schools that we have equipment that they purchase with different grants and things. Right. Right. So yeah. We, we did get grant funding that for, we just got resolved for, for Title One. For I Title think One. Exactly. So, so we're we'll still working on, on the installation. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I do know that we we interviewed for electrician yesterday, so hopefully we can <laughs> get them on board well, and, 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 and help on, with yeah, that. Help yeah. with the uh, installation of some of that kind of stuff too. Cool. Great. Any questions? Thank you very much. Okay. Very much. Great. Okay, Time to Care Act, Dr. Noel. I think I might have just closed you out. Don't have one good. Mm -hmm. Good evening, Mr. President, board members, Dr. Salins, executive team, for the record, Michael Noel, Director of Human Resources. I come before you tonight with just a very brief follow-up to last month's Time to Care Act because some of your questions, I don't think I articulated well enough what you needed to hear. So I want to kind of break down exactly uh, what it is and what it is not. So the $10,000 fee is our projected cost to join the coalition with uh, what Mr. Nagel informed me was 21 other counties. So strength in numbers is definitely going to benefit us moving forward with that. They will then take the lead on forming the RFP going out to bid and selecting the insurance group that will oversee the coalition. Um, by not joining the state, what that does is it buys us time. So our, our empl as, em as the employer and the employees, we will not have to pay as early as those that join the state. So that is what I did say. Um, but there will be an eventual cost and we will not know that yet. I can't tell you what that's going to be yet until after the RFP. But I will come back to you and keep you abreast of just where this process is. So at some point, there is going to be an employer share and an employee share. 
And once that rate is set, that's when we will sit down with the association and determine what those rate payments will be from employer and employee. Um, so the, the overall benefit of this is, again, strength in numbers and having MABE and MACO kind of drive the bus for most of the state with what this new uh, law is going to mean for our employees and for us as employers. But as I said, that hopefully clears up some of the questions that you had. If you do have others as we go through this, please don't hesitate to contact me and I will come back to you as we know more from the coalition that we did join to share with you the progress and where we are as a county and as a state with this program. Do we have a timeline of when we think the RFP will be ready? Uh, in the spring is when they will go to RFP. Um, and then we will know something after that. So that, that is when uh, Mave and Mako will, will go through the RFP process and select the vendor that they will then work with. They're already working with the Department of Labor um, so that they are in compliance with the law and, and working already behind the scenes to try and really get us the best rate possible. Um, yesterday, um, Mr. Wilson, Jack Wilson, represented Mako during the leadership meeting to discuss some of the stuff during the leadership lunch yesterday. So they may have some additional information that we get asked for. And so just to clarify, after they go to RFP and they select, then we'll get it, we'll know what um, contribution that the employer Correct. and the contribution that the employee Correct. has to make. The $10,000 was a payment into it That's to be into able to the join yes. so that they do the heavy lift, otherwise they, that would fall Correct. on us. Correct and gives us power in numbers. Right. Yes, right. Right. and by joining, we don't have to pay as early. Correct. Like the, uh, the, the law was pushed back a year already, but the, those that join the state plan have to start paying into it, employees and employers in October of next year, where we will not have to by joining the coalition for almost another year after Gives that. us an extended yes. time period. Right. Do we have, um, well, any of the, is 21 counties plus us, or there's 22 counties? There's, there's 21 total counties, okay. I believe. Do, Will you guys see what the um, proposals are before, or will this make and maybe just make that decision? They will make the, all those decisions. Make, okay. Yes, but I will share, as I learn, I will share with the board. Okay. All right, thanks all right. a lot. Dr. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Salins, update on the gender gap yes. issue, I guess. So the... Um, thank you, Dr. Kepler. Yeah. Gonna... Just don't ask me to say proficient. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the purpose of this presentation is to share the next steps and and the plan of action to review the gender gap that exists right. in and among the data points for Queen Anne's County. Um, just to give the board a little bit of history, which they know, but just to kind of bring it to the forefront that um, the board shared concerns that uh, the gender gap appeared to exist between female students that they were tending to outperform their male counterparts. And so I contacted the Regional Educational Laboratory of Mid-Atlantic to research the gap and to provide some recommendations in the reduction of the gap. And those reports and findings were actually um, proposed to the board at our last board meeting in September. So following that um, report, um, I tasked just like I did with the 620 policy of the board of members. We had some concerns about that. And I tasked Dr. Sprankle to create a team to be able to create a plan of action and make recommendations to the superintendent. So in that same style and format, um, I've done the same thing here. So under the direction of our assistant superintendent and in collaboration with her team of curriculum instruction folks, um, I've asked them to take a deeper dive into the district data points, which include specifically iReady. Dr. Kibler presented some of that information today, but not at the granular level of um, to recognize gender. Um, also attendance, discipline, um, other state data, specifically MCAP, but there are other tests as uh, Dr. Kibler shared this evening. Um, identify a structure to establish those trend data. So present those in some type of format for us to review. Identify additional instructional strategies that may be implemented throughout the district um, and by grade band, and then ultimately create a plan of action to present um, to me um, as well um, 
to be able to make some decisions on those recommendations in that plan of action. So the progress to date, um, the good news is, is that the CNI team has already had at least an opportunity to meet once. They reviewed the same report that the board members received. Um, they, what we consider in education, they unpacked that report um, of those recommendations. They highlighted some of the current recommendations that they're already doing that were in the report. And then they actually rejected some of the recommendations that were brought to the table, such as um, starting male students later than female students. So the timeline, the curriculum and instruction team will meet in October, again in November, again in December to complete a plan of action. The initial gender gap report will be taken to the CAC and the SSIC in October so that they can review it. Um, the plan of action will then be presented um, to the CAC and the SSIC in January to seek their feedback. And then the plan um, feedback will be reviewed by the curriculum and instruction team. So that information that Dr. Kibler gathers up from CIC and SSIC will go back to Dr. Sprankle's team and that will be reviewed in February. Um, the plan if ne needed because of the feedback and recommendations, if it needs to be updated, tweaked or modified in any way will take place on that. It'll be presented to me and then subsequently will come to the board in February. So that, that's kind of the plan of action. Um, welcome to some feedback from the board. Nice time. Excellent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. I, I knew nothing about, you know, I mean, this, this has been going on for a long time. But when I go to, you know, we know that if children get behind early stages, they never get caught up. And that's elementary school. Yes. But when I go to elementary schools, do you think because there's a lot of less male teachers in elementary school that some of these males aren't relating? as well as they would. I, mean, I don't know. That just, you I know. think there's many factors, to be honest with you. I think mm -hmm. that's just one. I think developmentally speaking, that male students don't develop as quickly as female students. That doesn't mean they don't have the same outcome at the end of the game, but in the start of the game, sometimes they're a little bit more, um, you know, developmentally struggling. Um, so I do think there's lots of different factors, but the great news is, is that the blueprint recognizes that you know, the foundation of learning needs to start as early as possible. And for that, they're putting in, you know, requirements for us as it relates to pre-K-3 and pre-K-4. And the greater news is that, you know, we we did a fast acceleration of that. So we did a three-year plan and we're in year two of that. We had 100 seats when I walked in the door. We have 240 pre-K seats. Um, next year, we're going to be adding 80 seats and we will have all the availability at that level in just three years for four-year-olds which is amazing. And when we get them in the door at three and four years old, we're gonna be able to adjust some of that foundation that they have so that they are truly ready at kindergarten to accept that learning. And so I think there's gonna be a lot of variations to this. Um, you know, you also throw in the amount of tutoring that we've been getting money for that, um, which is going to no doubt impact this as well. Um, so there's gonna be a lot of different variables. I, as a matter of fact, I'm not sure that we're able in the long run to pinpoint you know, when you see that reduction, it's probably going to be attributed to many different factors and not just one. Um, but I kind of say, let's let's let the team do some work. Let's look at some solid strategies, and then let's put all those strategies to it. And hopefully, one or a combination of them will assist in in reducing that gap. And not just honestly between the genders, but just reducing the gap between all of our students that they're all achieving at their highest potential. Mm -hmm. So. Any other questions? Mm -mm. All right, I know that answered a lot of questions we had earlier. So uh, we're set for a, thanks Matt, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Again, and Dr. Salen, so we're set for a break. Do we want to just keep on going? I say keep All right. on going, yes. See a lot of nodding heads, all right. So uh, current action items, overnight trip approval for the Queen Anne's County High School Lions Band, Mr. Wright. Good evening, board. I am Eric Wright, the band director at Queen Anne's County High School, and uh, we are coming to uh, petition for uh, approval of our spring trip this year. Um, for us, uh, looking at this, it's a very special one in the fact that this was supposed to be the exact trip that we were supposed to go on at the end of April of 2020. <laughs> And we had looked forward to it for a couple of years as, as I had been developing a rotation plan over four years and where we would go in each of those years. 
And at one point we had gone out to Sandusky, Ohio, but knowing what weather is and festivals don't happen until mid-May and all of our testing, uh, the windows changed and so we had to bring something around into a different place. And so we had looked to replace that with going down to the festival down at Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. And 2020 was to be the first chance to try that new location and new festival. And we know how the world happened with that. So um, as we started back in uh, and started with uh, um, going down to the festival down in uh, Norfolk and Williamsburg last year, we had a very successful uh, reinstatement of the programs that we were doing and uh, things turned out very well for us. And so uh, we are looking to uh, head down to Pigeon Forge um, this year. Uh, on that schedule, um, we would uh, leave from Queen Anne's County High School on Thursday morning, travel down and uh, get settled in on Thursday evening. And then Friday morning after breakfast, we would actually have the opportunity to visit the Titanic Museum. Uh, we have heard a lot of very positive things about it. And just when I said we were going to Pigeon Forge, I had several students say, can we go to the Titanic Museum? And I said, that is one of our proposed places to go. So we would do that with our adjudicated concert performance on stage at a local high school then uh, Friday evening. And then Saturday morning, first thing, the Marching Lions would do a parade review um, there at the high school in a parking lot, most likely. Um, and then uh, we would then uh, be able to spend the day at Dollywood where we would attend our award ceremony and then travel home on Sunday. So that would be our itinerary and plan uh, for the trip. Well, I, I must say you're enthusiastic. I, I was at the high school a couple nights ago, stopped by the stand to get a hamburger and was talking to a few of your booster members. Uh, very energetic, very people that are positive. I think you go to Orlando every another couple of years. As a, every four years, four we've years done the uh, yeah done the uh, trip to do the uh, 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 Disney live on stage and have done that uh, several times in my tenure here. So. The only problem is I dated myself. I asked them if they remember going to London and <laughs> they remember. That. <laughs> 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 but anyway, they they were very enthusiastic and it's a great job you guys do. Thank you. Do you need any more chaperones? <laughs> sure. I will always take chaperones. <laughs> Vision Forge is fun. Yeah. All right. Do we have a motion? Sure, Mr. President, I move that we allow the Queen Anne's County High School Band to travel to Pigeon Ford, Tennessee from May 2nd, May 5th. Uh, the budget source is from a variety of student payments, fundraisers, and boosters. Second. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right, thank you so much. Yep, you're good. Right, thank yes. you very much. Okay, uh, we've reviewed the human resources and substitute bus driver report. Do I have a motion? Mr. President, I move to accept the HR report as presented. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, back to uh, the capital improvement program. Mr. Brackla. Good evening again, Daryl Barraclow, School Facility Planner, um, seeking approval for the 2025 Capital Improvement Program. All right, and we've already mm -hmm. gone over that. Uh, Mr. President, I move that we accept the Capital Improvement Program for fiscal year 25 as presented. Second. All right, motion second. No more discussion, I assume. Mm -hmm. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thanks again. Thank you. No, uh, oh. um, Okay, so we have uh, Ms. Smith, who's not here. She showed up early in closed session uh, for reasons of privacy of the students. We have three non-public tuition um, contracts that need to be approved. Is that right? May I ask for all three at the same time, since we, there's going to be no discussion? Is that all right? I think it's fine. You can do it either way. Okay. Sure. Uh, Mr. President, I move that we accept uh, the two non public tuition uh, students for Phillips School in Laurel. Uh, each of them is for the total of $63,910.80 from our fiscal year 24 restricted and unrestricted funds. And then also one non-public tuition for the Children's Guild Incorporated Transformation Academy in, uh, it says McLean. 
and that would be for a total of $151,202.11 from fiscal year 24 restricted and unrestricted funds. Second. Okay, motion to second on those three uh, tuition contracts. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, so all three have passed. And that brings us to citizen participation, public comment. Do we have anybody else sign up? Okay, hearing none. Future meetings and events. Harry, when's our uh, next work session? 14 plus uh, 4 is 28. Are we having a... We do it, the 18th, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, and November 1st, 6 p.m. will be the open session, regular first of the month meeting for the board. Thank you very much for that. And uh, do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Well, second. before that, does anybody have anything else? No? Okay. Motion to second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you very Thank much, you. everybody. Thank you.